So today, what I want to do is essentially continue from last week and, and go through a method where we can essentially approximate residue curves, but more importantly, a method where we can estimate where our distillation boundaries are. Because if we know where our distillation boundaries are, we at least know what, we, what regions we can and we can't use distillation to cross. Okay? And then, after that, we'll move on to look at uh, pressure swing distillation, which is one potential method to get round having azeotropes in our system. And we'll also look and see if there's a way of estimating calculations from the shortcut calculations that you did a while ago now, the Fensky-Underwood equations, if there's, a, if there's a method we can use for them to at least try and get as an approximation of the distillation design, even though we have azeotropes within our system. <clears throat> so this is what we saw last week and what I was just kind of saying. So we've got our distillation curves, which are total reflux, and we've got our residue curves, which are no reflux in a batch. But actually, because they're quite similar, we can be quite happy that uh, they kind of give us at least a good indication of what's really happening in our distillation column. Okay? But as you saw from attempting the tutorial question, it's not exactly a quick process if we do it by hand. Okay? But also, what we need to do that is essentially we need all of the vapor-liquid equilibria or a model for all of the vapor-liquid equilibria for the system. If we don't have that model, we can't generate these curves. But what we can do is a much quicker method that allows us to estimate where these curves are and, as I said, more importantly, where we can put these distillation boundaries, which are the ones that we can't cross with our distillation separations. So what we need for this approximate method is we essentially need to know where all the azeotropes are in our system and also the temperatures of those azeotropes for the pressure that we're working in. Okay? Now, even though full vapor-liquid equilibria data isn't always available for a lot of systems, especially ternary systems, often one thing that is available is a collection of the azeotropes, the composition and the temperature of the azeotropes for such ternary systems. Okay, so if you look online, there's actually databases that just list these azeotropes for the system. So if we have this information, <coughs> then what we can do is we can use a method that's actually built around um, some of our distillation knowledge, but also around uh, some understanding of topology to actually allow us to predict uh, our residue curves. And what we end up basically having to do is classify all of our azeotropes or our pure components, which we can refer to as singular points, we end up classifying them as either stable nodes, unstable nodes, or saddles. Okay? So these are the three types of points we can have to, to allow us to estimate this. So just to sort of introduce these quite quickly, so our three types, stable, unstable, node, and our saddle point. If all our residue curves are pointing in to our node here. So this is a node on the side of our ternary diagram and this is a node in the corner. All of our residue curves are actually pointing into that. We can classify that as a, a stable node. An unstable node is essentially the complete opposite. So all of our residue curves are pointing away uh, from, from that. That would be an unstable node. And then a saddle point essentially some of our residue curves are coming in and some of our residue curves are pointing away. Okay, and that would be a saddle point. Yep. So 
if we think quickly about our zeotropic system from before, our low, uh, our light key here with our lowest boiling point, this, uh, this has all of our residue curves pointing away from it, so we would classify that as an unstable node. Our intermediate, which is our middle boiling component in this system, some of our residue curves point towards and some point away, so we would have a saddle. And then at the top, with our highest boiling point here, all of our residue curves are pointing towards that, so in that case, that one would be a stable node. Okay? So it's just from the patterns of the residue curves where we can identify these node or saddle types. So, as well as being able to identify these types, we can then use a couple of rules or bits of information that we know to actually work out what we need to do. So, the first set of information we know is essentially based on our knowledge of distillation and vapor liquid equilibria and our system. And that would be that the number of nodes plus the number of saddles that have one component associated to them. So think of that as all the pure components we've got in our system. So the total number of all the pure components must add up to three. Okay? It's a ternary system, so there's three components. Yep. The second one is that our number of binary azeotropes, so the number of azeotropes we have on the outside of our ternary diagram that exists between two of our components, the number of binary azeotropes must be less than or equal to three. Okay? But it doesn't matter if they're nodes or saddles, there just has to be three or fewer of them, which is most systems. And the third one is that for our ternary azeotrope, we either have one ternary azeotrope or no ternary azeotropes. Okay? So this is, what, this is the extent that this method works for. And as this covers probably about 99% of all ternary systems, we're quite happy with just keeping it restricted to, to that set of parameters. Okay? So does that make sense so far? Yep. Good. And then the other key equation that we'll, we'll need to use is actually one centered round topology. Okay? So I'm not going to go into the development of this equation in any way because we'd all need probably 48 to 36 hours of uh, master's level topology courses to understand what's going on. Uh, but essentially, what this is, is it's basically saying if you have a surface and for that surface to exist and be real and connected together that if you've got so many stable nodes, so many saddles, that these could only be certain fixed numbers, otherwise it's impossible to actually connect that surface as a single surface. Okay? But basically it boils down to that we've got essentially the number of ternary nodes, and the number of ternary saddles, the number of binary nodes minus the total number of our binary azeotropes and the number of our pure component nodes must equal to two. Okay? So that's the key equation for this. As I say, it's, it comes from knowing topology, but for us, someone else has very kindly calculated it for us. So we actually just need to apply it while using this method to find the approximate uh, curves, okay? So as I say, this method is really useful for just giving us a rapid sketch of our curves or finding distillation boundaries. And essentially it follows 
these nine steps. Okay? So what I'm going to do is go through these nine steps as an example, and then there's an example for you to do to, to make sure that you sort of understand these nine steps. So the first of these is, I think, the easiest part. So <clears throat> what we need to do is we've got our components. So in this case, we're just going to use components H, I, and L. And we know the boiling point temperatures of our components. And we can just plot the location of these pure components on our ternary system. So we know they must be in the corners. And we've got nothing labelled on our diagram so far, so in this case we've got a free choice of which corner to use for each component. So we can start and put our, our highest boiling component in this bottom corner over here, our intermediate boiling component in this corner over here, and then our light boiling component at the top of our ternary diagram. Okay, so all we've done is just defined our axis for our system. Okay? The next part of step one is to also plot our azeotropes on our system. Okay? So as I say, we can often find just databases of the different uh, the compositions of azeotropes and the boiling point of those azeotropes. So essentially you can find data like this for many ternary systems. So in this case, <clears throat> we have one azeotrope between our light and our intermediate component. Okay? So we know because it's between the light and intermediate component and doesn't contain any of our heavy component that it must lie on this axis here. And it's 30% intermediate and it's a 115 degrees boiling point so we can plot this azeotrope on our system. Okay? The next one is we have an azeotrope between our light and heavy components and at 80 degrees, so we can plot that location on our ternary diagram. And we have a third binary azeotrope which between our intermediate and our heavy at 105, so we can plot that on our system. Okay? So that links to what I just said before, that if they're the binary azeotropes, then they're on the outside of our ternary diagram. We also have a fourth azeotrope to deal with, and you can see it's listed here, in the light and the intermediate, but you can see that that doesn't add up to 100%, therefore it must also include our heavy component. So this is a ternary azeotrope, so it's somewhere inside our space, so we can plot this point on our ternary diagram as well, and it goes here. Okay, so does that make sense so far? Yeah, we're just locating our azeotropes and labelling with, with the boiling points on our ternary system. So what we've got now is we can determine the value of B, which is our number of binary azeotropes. So clearly, one, two, three, binary azeotropes, so B is three. We also can note we've got one ternary azeotrope. And the other thing we can also note is that what we have is two minimum boiling binary azeotropes. And if you remember to last week, the minimum boiling azeotrope was when the temperature of that azeotrope was lower than both of the pure components. So, for instance, here, we've got an azeotrope that's 105, made up of 1 of 110 and 1 of 120, so that would be a minimum. We've got our one over here, which is 80, and that's made up of the 90 and the 120, thus is also a minimum. And our final binary azeotrope is a maximum, and you can see 115 degrees, and that's obviously higher than both the 90 and the 110 boiling points of the components that made up of. Okay? So now we've set out our base system. 
The second step is what we need to do is draw arrows around the edges of our triangle. So essentially, we're putting the residue curves that are the limit, the exterior limit of our system. And we want to add an arrow on them in direction of increasing temperature, because that's the direction that residue curves point, yep, as we discussed last week. So, for instance, we can add the first one here. So we're going from our 80 degrees azeotrope and we're pointing to our 90 degree pure component. Yep. And then we can t continue this process around. So our next one, we've got 90 to 115. So that would point towards our azeotrope. Our next one goes from our bottom 110, but in this case it points back to our azeotrope. Okay. So you'll, you see there that because this is a maximum boiling azeotrope, the arrows are both pointing towards it from the pure components. Our next one, 110 to 105, so therefore this arrow would point back to our pure component. Again, on this side, arrow points back to our pure component, and in this case, we've identified that to be a minimum one, and you can see our arrows are both pointing away from our minimum one to our pure components. And then obviously our final one here, where our arrow points back towards our pure component with the highest boiling point. Okay? So all we've done there is just plotted our exterior residue curves on our diagram. Okay? Now, now we've got these exterior arrows, exterior curves plotted on, what we can do is actually determine the type of singular points we have, but just for the pure components. Okay? So the pure component singular points are only determined by these exterior residue curve arrows. Okay? So if you remember back to what I was just saying, so, so what are our options? If, if both of the arrows are pointing towards, we have a stable node. If both of the arrows are pointing away, we have an unstable node. And if one arrow is pointing towards and one arrow is pointing away, we've got a saddle. Okay? So the first point we can take would be our top point here. And we've got one residue curve in, one residue curve out. So we would define it as a saddle, so an S. And also, because it's a pure component only made up of one, uh, one compound, so it's an S1. Our next one here, we've got one coming in and one going out, so again it's a saddle, and again it's a pure component, so it's an S1. And then our final component here, we've got one pointing in and two pointing in, so everything's pointing towards it. Yep, so it's, a, it's an N1, because it's a node but it happens to also be a stable node, because everything's pointing towards it. Okay? So we've got one pure component node and two pure component saddles in this system. Okay? You all following so far? Yep. So step four that's where it starts to get more interesting. So step four starts to bring in if we've got a ternary, a ternary azeotrope. So in our case here, we have a ternary azeotrope. And what we want to know is, is this ternary azeotrope a node or a saddle? Okay? And there's two tests we can use for this. And if it passes one or more of those tests, we can essentially say that it's a node. So the first test is if the number of pure component nodes plus the number of binary azeotropes is less than four, this must be a node. Okay? And that's, again based on our topological understanding of the system. But this is our, one of our tests. 
if the number of pure component nodes plus binary azeotropes is less than four, then alternary azeotrope must be a node. So in this case, we've got one, ternary, uh, one pure component node and three binary azeotropes, which is four, but four is not less than four, so it fails the first test. Okay? So that's not true, but we still have the second test, which is, of course, so the second test is, and I'll read it, excluding the pure component saddles, the ternary azeotrope has the highest, second highest, lowest, or second lowest boiling point of all species. Obvious, right? <laughs> no. So, so what we do is we label all of our, all of our singular points in order of their boiling point, okay? And then we remember that it said excluding the pure component saddles. So we know that we've got one component saddle, which is our intermediate. So excluding our intermediate, because it's a pure component saddle. We've got another one, which is our pure component for our light boiler. So we can remove that. Okay. And then what that more complicated sentence was actually saying is, if you remove your pure component saddles, which we have, is your ternary node in your new list, is it in the top two or is it in the bottom two? Yep. And in our case, it's in the bottom two. And if it's in the top two or the bottom two, then we can define it to be a node. So in this case here, we can say that our ternary azeotrope is a node. Okay? So you can see what we're doing is, is we're slowly building up all the information that we have about our system so that we can then start to use the topological equations we have to calculate more information about our system. <clears throat> so step five only comes in if we have a saddle. Okay? So in our case, we have a node. So what I'll do is I'll leave you to check in the handbook to see what you have to do if it ends up being a saddle. Okay? But what we'll do is we'll jump to step six, which is what we need to do if it's a node. Okay? So what we now need to do for step six is we want to use our topological relationship. Here it is to actually allow us to calculate how many of our binary azeotropes are nodes and how many of our binary azeotropes are saddles. So if you can see, we can take our topological relationship here and we can rearrange that for our number of binary nodes. And what you can see is that now the numbers we want are the number of ternary nodes in this case, we've got one of them. The number of ternary saddles. In this case, we've got none of them. The number of binary azeotropes we have in total, which is three. And the number of pure component nodes we have, which we've already identified to be one. Okay? So we have all the information we need to calculate that this number of binary nodes is equal to one. So one of our binary azeotropes is a node. Okay? As a point here, this relationship there I will always give you in the exam. Okay? So of course our binary azeotropes must be either a node or a saddle. They, there's nothing else they can be. So if we've got one node then we know we must have two binary azeotrope saddles. Okay? So now we've identified all of the types of singular points we have for all of our singular points. But for our binary ones, we've yet to actually work out which one is which. But we know there's two saddles and one node. Okay? <clears throat> 
So step seven, what we now need to do is we need to do a check on our system. So we need to do a check on our system to make sure that it has a unique solution. Okay? Annoyingly, it's so far in a step seven to suddenly find out the method doesn't work. But we need the information we've already gained to, to actually do this. So what we need to do for this check is we need to determine what's called the number of intermediate boilers. So the number of binary intermediate boilers. And these are simply the binary azeotropes that are not the highest boiling point or not the lowest boiling point. Okay? So if we take our same table that we've just used with everything ranked together, all we need to do is count the number of binary azeotropes that aren't at the very top of that table or the very bottom of that table. So in this case, our binary Li, tick, because it's not at the top. Our binary IH, tick, because it's not at the top or bottom. But our LH1 is at the bottom, so we don't include that. So our number of binary intermediate boilers are just the two binary azeotropes that we have there, the Li and the IH1. Okay? And the reason that we need to know this is we need to make these two consistency checks. The first one is that the total number of binary azeotropes minus the number of intermediate boiling azeotropes must be equal to the number of binary nodes we have. Okay? So in this case, 3 minus 2 equals 1, which is true. And the second check that we need is that the number of binary saddles has to be less than or equal to the number of binary intermediate boilers. And in this case, we've got two of each, so two is less than or equal to two, so that one is okay. So if these two checks are not true, if one of them fails, then it's highly likely that the data you have is wrong. Okay? So in real, when you're doing this, Every so often, this might happen. You might find that something has been recorded wrong or the experiment wasn't accurate enough to get proper data. Okay? For the exam, if one of these checks fails, I've not set a question <laughs> where that would happen. Okay? So if you have a question on this topic and in the exam one of these checks fails, check what you have done because you will have done something wrong because I'm only going to set you a question where you can actually solve it to the answer. Yep. So it's a nice little check for you to, to make a check. Yep. These two? No, you'll have to remember these two. Okay. Um, but the, the topological one, you'll get, but you'll just have to, you'll have to remember what you need to check, okay? So, yeah, so this allows us to check our data, and I say, in the real world, unfortunately, sometimes, because of experimental accuracy or because of the database you're using, these may fail, but hopefully... These checks work, and if they do, we essentially know that the boiling point data is okay for our system. Okay? Now, the other check we have is that if the number of binary saddles does not equal the number of intermediate boiling binary azeotropes, then there is not a unique solution using this method. Okay? So, again, in reality, what you would have to do is you'd actually have to calculate the full residue curve maps using a full VLE model. But in the exam, I'm only going to give you one 
that you can actually calculate the answer to. So if you do this test and it fails to give it fails and says there isn't a unique solution, then again check what you have done because I'm only going to give you an option where there is a unique structure. And if there is a unique structure, the number of binary saddles must equal the number of intermediate boiling binary azeotropes. Okay? So we're all following so far? Yeah? Yeah. So we've identified all of our singular point types. We've now done our consistency checks to make sure that the data we have is okay and that this method is going to work. So now what we need to do is actually try and find out where our distillation boundaries are. So, in all cases, the number of distillation boundaries is equal to the number of binary saddles in our system. Okay? So, in our example here, we have two binary saddles. So, we're going to have two distillation boundaries that we're going to try to need to draw on our system. So, to check these and to actually see if these distillation boundaries work, essentially we have these four key rules. And we can start from this and say, so each binary saddle must be connected to a node, and, but that node can be anything, a pure component, a binary node or a ternary node. But if it's a binary saddle, it must be connected to a node. A ternary node must be connected to at least one binary saddle. A pure component node cannot be connected to a ternary node. And an unstable node cannot be connected to a stable node. Okay? So that's our four key rules. And what that essentially means when we're determining connections from our binary saddles is that if we have a minimum boiling binary saddle we must connect to an unstable node at a lower temperature and if we have a maximum boiling binary saddle we must connect to a stable node that boils at a higher temperature okay so low to low high to high yep low boiling point um, binary to a node at a lower temperature and a maximum boiling point binary saddle to a higher temperature node. Okay? So in reality, what we need to do oh. Ah, I see, sorry, I see what's happening now. Um, so if you remember, we already allocated these type, these, uh, these saddles, these binary saddles, sorry, these binary singular points of binary azeotropes as either maximum or minimum boiling azeotropes. So this one is a maximum. So following this rule, if it was a saddle, it would have to be connected to a node at a higher temperature. And these two here are minimum. So if they happen to be saddles, they would need to be connected to a node at a lower temperature. Okay? So it's best because we know that our ternary node must be connected to at least something, it's best to start by considering our connections to our ternary node. Okay? And unfortunately, we just have to do this by, by trial and error. Okay? So the first one we can do is we can actually say, well, let's connect this binary azeotrope to our ternary node. Okay? So if we were to do that, we would get a node here. Our ternary node would have our line pointing towards it. So that would make it a stable node. And our saddle here has everything pointing away from it, which would make it an unstable node. 
but from our rules, we can't have a stable node connected to an unstable node. Yep. So this, this option here is not, is not possible. Okay. So our second option, if we would join our ternary node to our maximum boiling azeotrope here, this would then make our node an unstable node, and this would make our binary azeotrope here a stable node. So again, we would end up with an unstable node connected to a stable node. Yep, but we can't have that. So again, that's not possible. Okay. So our third option would be connect our ternary node to our minimum boiling azeotrope here at the bottom. And if we do that, we end up with our residue curve pointing away from our node. So we end up with an unstable ternary node. And if we look at our azeotrope here, we have one pointing in and two leaving. So that would make it a saddle. So that sounds promising so far. It's a minimum boiling saddle, binary saddle, right? And a minimum boiling has to be connected to an unstable node at a lower temperature, and 100 is lower than 105. So everything there checks out, and we can actually say that that is one of our distillation boundaries, okay? So we've got the first one of our distillation boundaries on our system now. So the next thing we need to do is try and place our second distillation boundary because we know there was two because there's two binary saddles. Okay? So we've tried both of these now here connected to the ternary node and that wouldn't work. So now we need to think about connecting these to something else, so to our pure components we can think about connecting them to. And again, we sort of continue by thinking in a trial and error approach. <clears throat> so we know one is a saddle and one is a node, yep, because we've already taken one of our saddles away. So let's think about the LH, so our LH azeotrope here. If that was a minimum boiling saddle, yep, then it would have to be connected to an unstable node that boils at a lower temperature. Okay? So we need something lower, we need a singular point on our system lower than 80 degrees C. But that azeotrope is our lowest boiling point on the whole diagram. So it's clearly impossible for us to connect that to anything with a lower boiling point because there's no lower boiling points on our diagram. So we clearly can't connect this one as our saddle. Okay? So we must think that this one is likely to be our node. Okay? Now if our Li azeotrope is the saddle, Li, then it's a maximum boiling saddle for it must be connected to a stable node at a higher temperature. Okay? So if we look around our diagram, so we need a node, here's a node, it's a stable node, and 120 degrees is higher than 115 degrees, so that sounds like a promising connection. Okay? So if we connect our azeotrope here to our pure component, this would define this to be a binary saddle. Okay? And then, as I said, this was also define our last point here to be a binary node, okay? which would end up being an unstable node. And actually what we've done there is we've drawn out two distillation boundaries that we need for this particular diagram. Okay? Now what we can also do is, is from these distillation boundaries, we can actually think about what our approximate residue curves would look like. Okay? 
Now, to think about these approximate residue curves, what we do is we start from an unstable node and then we end them at a stable node. And what we do is we follow the arrows around that we've got in our distillation boundaries. We follow those arrows to actually approximate the residue curve. So in this case, we've got our unstable node here and we're following the arrows around to approximate some residue curves in this area. And we can do exactly the same for our bottom here. So we've got our unstable node. And if we go this way, we can follow the arrows around like that. Or this way, we can follow the arrows like this. And we end up generating a set of residue curves that look like that. OK? So say the key thing is it defines our distillation boundaries. But then we can have an approximation at some of our residue curves. Okay? But what I want to move on to now is a potential method we have to actually look at distillation using distillation columns when we have an azeotrope in our system. And the advantage of this method is, is that this actually works with just two components. So you don't need to add a third component, like we've been thinking about with the ternary diagrams. Uh, and we'll see in the next lecture uh, some of the methods that involve adding a third component. So this advantage here is really we don't have to add that component. But the disadvantage we have is that what we need is we need an azeotrope, so our binary azeotrope. But we need to be able to change the composition of where that azeotrope falls by changing the pressure of our system. Okay? And what we really need is that we need this composition to move by greater than about 5 mole percent over a moderate range of pressure. So maybe about 4, 5, 6 bar change in pressure. Okay? Now, if this happens, that's very useful to us because then we can look at this method without adding anything. But as we'll talk about more in the next lecture, there are many azeotropes where this doesn't happen. They're kind of insensitive to the pressure. The composition of the azeotrope is insensitive to the pressure of the system. So if we've got this, then we can use two ordinary distillation columns and we operate the two columns at different pressures. Okay? So what we need is basically we need a pump or a compressor, a compressor as well as those distillation columns to increase our pressure. But the advantage is we've got no additional component that we're adding to our system. So this is what we kind of look like for a, a minimum boiling azeotrope with pressure swing distillation. So we've got our standard temperature composition diagram here for our distillation systems. And if you remember, of course, this bottom line here is the temperature at which the liquid boils. So that's our bubble point line and our top line here is the temperature at which our vapor condenses so that's our dew point line okay and we've got our azeotrope position here where the temperatures of the bubble and the dew point are the same and that's our composition so this bottom curve here is at p1 and that's our low pressure and then this top curve here is exactly the same system, but for P2, so a higher pressure. Okay? And by increasing the pressure, what's happened is, is this azeotrope composition here has shifted from this composition to this composition. Okay? And with the pressure swing, we can take advantage of that shift in azeotrope composition. Okay? And we can think about this essentially as two coupled but normal distillation columns. So we can have our initial feed here that enters our first column and then just like our normal distillation column we would have a particular separation 
that occurs within our column. Okay? Our bottom or our bottom product, which is our hottest part of the distillation column, <coughs> that essentially gives us almost pure B, so that's good. But our top of our column here is the one that's constrained by our azeotrope. Okay? But what we can do is we can take this azeotropic composition here, and then we can increase the pressure as we move into our second distillation column. So what we end up doing is taking this, this top product from our first column, and we increase the pressure so it moves up to the vapor liquid equilibria in our second column. But what you can see is that because the azeotrope composition has moved, when we were on the left-hand side of the azeotrope, we're now at the higher pressure on the right-hand side of the azeotrope. Yep. So we've jumped over our azeotrope. So now, when we run our distillation column, we get our normal separation, but our bottom product at a high temperature is now almost pure A, and our top product is then constrained by our azeotrope, but instead of just throwing that away, because that would be a waste, what we can do is actually just recycle that back to our first column and drop the pressure in our system and put that back into our first column where the compositions are, are quite similar okay? and actually reuse that as a recycle. And what we've done is just by running these two columns at the different pressures, because of this shift in azeotrope in our VLE, has allowed us to get our pure B and a product of pure A. Yeah, whereas if we did that at just one column at one pressure, we wouldn't be able to get pure A from that particular feed. Okay? So if we had a system like that, then and we wanted to say, well, okay, well, we've now got a pressure swing system. We've managed to work out what separation we, we want. We've managed to achieve our separation because our azeotrope moves enough in the chain to pressure. But now we want to have a quick look at uh, the economics of our system. Then we perhaps think, oh, we can use the shortcut method because that gives us an approximate distillation design. But if you remember when when the shortcut was done earlier this year, what was the key thing that was needed for the shortcut to work? Okay? And that was an approximately constant relative volatility in our column. Yep. And the one thing that we know about azeotropes is that they don't have an approximately constant relative volatility. Okay, so in fact, let's, we can see this as an example. Here's a, here's a system here. So we've got our X against our Y, and we've got our VLE point as this line, and we've got our Y equals X line. And you can see here, around 80%, we've got our azeotrope. So if we, if we work out our relative volatility from this, at x equals 0.05. Our relative volatility we calculate from this line is 2.55. If we calculate our relative volatility at x1 equals 0.95, so over here, our relative volatility is 0.47. Now, that's not what you would define as relatively constant, right? If, if nothing else, at this part, our component 1 is less volatile than our component 2, and at this part, our component 1 is more volatile than component 2. Yep. So we can't, we can't think about that as a, as a constant relative volatility. In fact, 
if this is our potential separation here, so we want the XF to our feed, our bottom product, and our distillate, if we actually take an average relative volatility at these three points, we end up generating a relative volatility of 1.82. And if we draw that on our diagram to see what, what curve a relative volatility of 1.82 as a constant would be, it's actually that red line, which looks nothing like our azeotropic system. Yep. So we can't use the shortcut equations with something like this. Okay. But what we can do is actually think about a little modification to our system. Okay. So, quite interestingly, our azeotrope here being our key point, if I was to cover up everything above our azeotrope, that curve there looks quite like this red curve, but just compressed. Okay? So, what we can think about is actually looking at a transformation of our system. And instead of using our liquid composition and our vapor composition, our X and our Y, we can use these modified X prime and Y prime where we've actually divided by A, where A is the um, composition of our azeotrope. Okay? And that allows us to modify our system. Okay? But what I should do before I show you this sort of half working is that just to warn you that, of course, because we're making this approximation, it's never going to be as good as if we're using it on a zeotropic system where the relative volatilities are truly quite similar. Okay? But if we make this, this, this change here, then <clears throat> what we actually get for our system of 0.8 is we actually expand into this prime region here and we get a curve that looks like this. So all we've done is taken this half of our curve and divided it by our azeotrope composition. So that's 0.8. So we've done 0.8 divided by 0.8, which gives us 1. We've got our feed, which is 0.4. And 0.4 divided by 0.8 is 0.5. And you can see that's what we've transformed it into. So this would be our azeotrope up here at 1. And you can see, for example, our feed that was at 0.4x is now at 0.5x prime because we've done 0.4 divided by 0.8. Okay? So now we can actually think again about calculating these modified, the relative volatility based on these modified coordinate systems. So exactly as we would define the relative volatility for a regular system, we can also define alpha prime based on these prime coordinates. And if we do that, then and we take our B position, our feed position, our distillate position, then the average relative volatility of this, these three positions is 2.54. Okay? And if we actually draw that back on our diagram as a, as a constant relative volatility line, it's actually this red line, which is much, much, much closer to this transformed system than it was to the original system. So now what we can do is actually use the shortcut calculations with these in this prime domain, yeah, with our x prime and our alpha prime values, exactly as we'd use the shortcut calculations as you did just before reading week. Okay? And that will give you approximate calculations for the number of trays and the reflux ratio, etc., for your distillation columns where you're limited by the azeotrope as the top product. Okay?
So, what we've done today. So, we've looked, we focused on that method originally of trying to do an approximate distilla uh, distillation boundaries to find some approximate residue curves, which is obviously much faster than trying to calculate it by hand. And of course, you only need to know the azeotrope concentrations and azeotrope temperatures rather than the full VLE for the system. <coughs> then we've looked at one method where we can separate azeotropic systems, which is our pressure swing distillation, okay? where if we've got the advantage that the azeotrope composition moves with pressure, we can think about pressure swing distillation. Okay? And in the next lecture, we'll look at some other methods to separate azeotropic systems. And then also, we had a quick look there at how we can use an approximation for the shortcut methods to still allow us to get some results even when we've got these azeotropic systems in our, in our uh, distillation columns.